words have never been spoken. Let me tell you something. Well, how are we doing? If it's your first time here today, my name is Craig, and my wife Patty and I get to pastor this church, and I'm the forgetful pastor that doesn't even remember to bring his notes up to the stage, and if I would have left him over there, it would have been a shorter message, but I remembered him, so here we are. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are here today, and uh, so sort of graduate Sunday, or just here because it's your church, or you're visiting, why ever you're here, I am so glad that you are in the house. Um, we are going to continue our series called Breathe Life. And um, you remember how last week I told you that we were going to talk about the top 10 negative death-giving words that come out of our mouths? Anybody remember that? You remember what I said? That's awesome. Um, Here's the deal. I wrote that message. It's on my computer. It's completely finished and ready to go. Had the notes done and everything. And then as I was looking over it, it just didn't sit right with me. Um, it, It just didn't sit right with me. I do my best. To, this is going to be a very transparent sermon, so are you all, you all okay? I, I do my best to stay very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I do my best to listen to him and to bring forth a word that I feel like this church needs in this moment in time. And I, I do that. I've done that every week for over, over 17 years. Um, and over 30 years of full-time ministry and preaching, I have only changed my message at the end of the week three times. And this is one of those times, okay? Um, So we're still talking about breathing life, and you'll see that that comes out, but we might do the top 10 words. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Um, I I just want to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and I want to be obedient to him. I I just want to do that, okay? Um, Because here's the problem. Vision leaks. Vision leaks. And I preach vision all the time. I talk about vision. I share vision. And, you know, and I do that. And we say regularly, and this can be a trap that you can fall into, There's part of it's true, part of it whatever, um, so, but part of it is, hey, we're, this is South Point Church, here's the vision of the church, how can you be a part of this vision of this church? And that's true, but the other side of that I think is necessary as well, where it's, we are, here we are, South Point Church, but you have a vision for your life. You have a God-given vision for your life and your family, and what can South Point do to help you fulfill your vision? And I think we said at the beginning of the year that we wanted a better life, did we not? And I, I feel like one of the ways to get that is to incorporate into our lives the spiritual disciplines that God has put in front of us. I, I think, and we've talked about those a lot this week, and, or this year. And so we, we started this year talking about, remember we did an informal poll? Anybody remember that? And, and I, we said, how many of you want 2024 to be better than 2023? And almost 100% of you, those of you that were not on active drugs at the time, <laughs> raised your hand and said, dear God, yes, I want this year to be better than last year, and I warned you and told you that I was going to remind you of that all the way through the year, and here we are. Because a lot of times we'll forget New Year's resolutions. Some of you even forgot that you made New Year's resolutions. I'm here to remind you of all of that. We have 33 weeks left in this year. Take a deep breath. 33 weeks. Only 33 more Sundays. Actually, after today, 32 more Sundays. That's it. How's it going? How's it going? What does it look like? Is it better or is it not? And I think we have to start employing some, employing some of these spiritual disciplines into our lives to make it better. Okay, so let me back up a bit in our story. I'm just going to tell you our story. Um, over 17 years ago, when the Wendell family decided to move here, to the South Haven area, the DeSoto County area, we felt called as a family to come here to do a church that was different. It was a place where the the vision that we got was, hey, start a church for the unchurched. Start a church for the people who are disenfranchised with God. Start a church for people who are mad at God, disappointed at God, given up on God. Do a church for people that have want nothing to do with God and do a church for people who love God and want more. You know, do a church of basically a, an island of misfit toys, right? You know, a place where nobody fits but they have a place to fit. 
And then we moved here, and I'll be honest with you, when we moved here, I was intimidated. I was greatly intimidated because I drove around, and I had never seen so many churches in my entire life. Some of them were ginormous. Some of them were middle of the road. Some of them were small, but one way or the other, there were churches everywhere, everywhere. And I literally thought, this was one of my prayers, I literally thought, God, why did you bring me to a place where obviously everyone is a Christian? Because any place with this many churches on every corner where, let's be honest, we know roads in this area where parking lots touch of churches. Have you not been down Getwell Road? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. Okay. Literally, they touch, and I was just like, God, wh why did you bring, obviously that you've brought me to a place where there's no longer a need for another church. And then I realized after we got here, I realized that the, this place was very over-churched, but it wasn't over-Christian. And, and that, that was just like, oh, okay. Maybe there is a need. And then we put our roots down and started meeting people and hearing stories about the people that lived here, stories on the way churches had treated them. And I'm not preaching. We have amazing churches in DeSoto County. Okay, I'm not, I'm not church slamming at all. I'm just telling you a personal vision and what I feel like we need. Uh, Y'all track with me. Are we okay? Okay. And as we put roots down, I start hearing stories. And the team that was with us, Cindy was on the team. Of course, Patty was on the team because she's my, she my girl. Um, and we start hearing stories about different people in the area, misfits that no longer found a fit because they had been told they don't fit because of how they are or who they are. I mean, stories like people not being allowed in the sanctuary because they had a ball cap on. Stor Some of this might sound frivolous to you, but I mean, can I just tell you something? This messes people up. One guy came, and he's, he, he comes here now, but he said, he said, I went to a church, and I, I went in, and they wouldn't allow me in the sanctuary because I had tattoos showing, but they graciously told me that I could go sit in another room with a TV monitor where I could watch the service with other tattooed people. I have so many stories. People that have come, that they, they, they went somewhere else, but since they had a divorce and got remarried, that they, they, they could come, but they could no longer serve or be a part of anything or be a part of any team or board because that was in their past. Or people that black people were not allowed in a white church or white people were not allowed in a black church and biracial couples, well, good Lord, where do they go? And then over 17, great transition, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then over 17 years, God has blessed us with a cornucopia of craziness. It's messy, it's ugly, and I love every dusty minute of it. In this house right now, we have, we have tattoo artists and a, a lot of their clients. Can I get a whoop whoop? Um, um, <laughs> Divorced people, white people, black people, politicians, doctors, lawyers. I don't know why they come. But anyway, we, we, have, we, have, we even let Baptists come here. And we have all of these things. And see, what I love about it is people are no longer defined by their occupation or their past life. They're defined as a human being seeking Jesus Christ. It's different. It's just different. Even this, last, even this last Easter, here's a super recent, even this last Easter, there's a guy that I, I've known in the community since we moved here. He has never come to South Point. I've invited him a million times. Lord knows he needs it. Um, never, never come. And I've, just, I've even been to his house a couple times. And in all of that learning over 17 years, I learned that he is a, a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So if, by the way, that still exists in Mississippi, praise God, it's shrinking. Come on, somebody, and just... Kill it, kill it, kill it. Anyway, um, spent time with him, and, but never came to church, no, ch whatever. And then this Easter Sunday, I see him. He walks in. 
And he's looking rough. He's looking rough. And I, I go up to him and I'm like, dude, I haven't seen you in, it was like five years. I haven't seen you in like five years. How have you been? He starts sharing some medical things and some things going on in his life. He's just not doing well. And I said, well, let me just be real blunt. Why are you here? I just asked him. He's a very crass person. You know, I was just like, why are you even here? And he said this. He said, I knew I could come here. I'm looking for hope. We have to create a place where misfits can come and still experience this beautiful thing called love, the love of God. And that's, that's what this place is, and I love every minute of it. I hate it when I cry. Sorry about that. <laughs> See, misfits will never come to a place where they don't think they fit because they've already been told they don't fit so many times. Why would they dare take the chance to come somewhere else where they don't fit? They've already been told that. And this happened the same, this went on the same time in the life of Jesus. There's nothing different about it, honestly. Jesus, get this, there were so many people that did not fit the Jewish synagogue culture, the ethos, culture, ethos, the ethos of that whole thing. And what did Jesus do? Jesus knew that they didn't fit in his ethos. So what did our Lord and Savior do? He left the ethos, his ethos, to take his ethos, his culture, to a group of people who would never fit in there. And he said, I'm here where you are and you fit with me. He left them, the, his ethos... It, in Matthew chapter, oh, what is it, chapter 18, Jesus tells this story where there was this shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and you've probably heard this story. There was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of the sheep wandered off. One of the sheep decided that there was a better way to live, you know? So he left the pen, and he went out, and he got in some deep sheep, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, you ever been in deep sheep? I mean, have you ever had a, a sheep? Let's just move on. And so the sheep moves out. I don't know what he got into. Jesus doesn't go into it, but I'm sure he got into some nasty sheep stuff, right? And what does the Bible tell us? What does Jesus say? What does the story say? It says that the shepherd left the safe, well-behaved, well-groomed 99 because one of them was lost. One of them couldn't stay. One of them had a better idea of a better life somewhere else. They weren't doing anything right. Come on, some sheep just don't do what's right. But they're still sheep. And he says this. This is how he ends the story, Matthew 18, 13. And if he finds it, talking about the sheep and the deep sheep, and if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. We can get to a safe place in Christianity and in church world where we're just comfortable. And we live our comfortable, boring, mundane lives because we know we're good. It's kind of like, have you ever flown on an airplane? Anybody, anybody ever flown on an airplane? Anybody, anybody? If you've flown on an airplane at any point in time, you've heard the same announcement from the stewardess every single time. In an unlikely event that there is a decrease in cabin pressure, oxygen masks will be lowered from the ceiling, right? Layman's terms, hey, listen, it's probably not going to happen, but if this spaceship right here starts plummeting towards the earth, you ain't going to be able to breathe, and we're just going to drop some masks out of the ceiling, right? <laughs> Come on, that's the truth. And, but what do they tell you after that? They say, if you're traveling with a small child, Come on, come on. You said you flew. It's the same speech everywhere you go. If you travel with a small child, fit your oxygen mask on first and then help the small child. And in Christianity, what do we do too many times? We put our own oxygen mask on and then we see somebody else hurting and gasping for a breath of fresh air and we just say, well, I'll pray for them, Lord. You need to help them. And the Lord says, I'm trying, but you're not obeying. There, there's people that need what we have. And if all we do is sit in our comfort and in our schedule and in our normal living, they're not receiving a breath of life. All right. 
Back to our story. Back to our story. Um, so at the beginning of the church, we wanted to do just that. That was our goal. It was to go where the one was, the one sheep in the deep sheep, the sheep in the deep sheep. And I'm going to stop saying that because you know me and my tongue twisters. <laughs> and we call it this thing servolution. We call it servolution. And it's a revolution, a revolution, bringing it back because Jesus started it way. It's nothing new. It's a, it's a revolution of actually going out to where the hurting people are to serve them in a self-sacrificial love that nobody understands until you first experienced it. Not trying to get them say, and see, some of you right now are like, how are you off? You're so off track. You said, you, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, that you wanted a better year. Can I tell you, Jesus tells us how to get a better year. Look at this. This is what Jesus said. You're guilty. We're all guilty. We wanted a better year. Here's how Jesus said in Acts 20, verse 35, he said, And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of our Lord Jesus. It is more blessed. It's better. Your life will go better to give than to just receive. Here's another example, Luke 22, 25. It says, Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here in the kingdom of God. Because I'm Jesus Christ, I am the starter of the kingdom of God, and where am I? I am among you as one who serves. He taught it time and time again, and then on top of that, he modeled it. I love that Jesus is not just a teller, he's a modeler. And, and on the night before he died, before he was crucified, they, had, they were in the upper room. You guys remember this story? They did communion. We've talked about that. The Last Supper, call it what you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And another thing that he did there, and you guys probably already know this, he did something spectacular that blew all of their minds. All 12 of the disciples, he washed their feet. And you might not, you might be like, oh, what is, what, I don't want to wash. Okay, you need to understand that washing feet back then was a cultural thing. It was not a, so for example, it's like this. Um, if it's winter, not, not now in, in the spring slumber of Mississippi, but in the winter, you go over somebody's house and they'll say something just customary, like, can I take your coat? It, it's a customary thing. And so people would wash the feet of the guests of the house, and nobody did that. And so Jesus says, I'll wash your feet. It's the lowest of the low job, but it's a job that needs to be done, but it's serving at its highest, but yet it's a serving at its lowest. And he, ser he, he served, wash all of them. Look at this verse, John 13, verse 12 and following. After washing their feet, and who, who are they? We, I, we just said it, right? The 12 disciples. After washing their feet, he put his robe on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I just did? You've called me your teacher and Lord, and, and you're right, for that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and Lord and have just washed your dirty, funky, stanky feet, then you should follow the example that I've set for you. And you say, well, so we're supposed to, what? no, no, example, not action. Are you, are you tracking with me? You should follow the example that I've set for you and wash one another's dirty feet. How do... Now, do for each other what I have just done for you. I speak to you timeless truth. A servant is not superior to his master, and an apostle is never greater than the one who sent him. So now, put into practice. Come on, all you Wednesday night master class people. So now, put, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you weren't there, you ain't been there on Wednesday night, whatever. So now, put into practice practice what I have done for you, and you will experience a better 2024 than 2023. You will experience a life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. We have to serve. And what a, a lot of times we'll say, 
Well, here's the church mind. Ready? Can I tell you the churchy church church mindset? Yeah. The churchy church church mindset is, Pastor, I'm all about serving. Really, truly, I am. If I've got time off of my yacht, I'll serve. But we need to make sure we only serve the true sheep of the house. Those that have their life together. You, you never hear, you didn't, Jesus didn't kneel. Do you know who else in that 12? He washed Judas's feet. The very betrayer. And Jesus kneels down before him and he doesn't say, Judas, I'm going to wash your feet like everybody else, but first you need to, Judas, you're a betrayer, um, and I'll wash your feet and serve you, but I need you to come to church with me on Sunday, and I need you to confess your sins, because I need you to be right, and so if you'll, if you'll, Commit to do all of that, then I'll serve you. It's, it, it's also not in there where John, the beloved, he's called the beloved disciple who loved Jesus the most, and they say Jesus loved him the most. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, he didn't kneel down before John and say, John, I'm serving you because you love me so much. He, he didn't say that either. And it blows my mind. I got a letter. Can I just read you a letter? Um. I got, I don't often do this, but I'll do it today. I'm feeling squirrely. Um, I got a, after we did, it was a few years ago, we did a serve event, and we did a couple things in that serve week. We, we served, um, we went to the strip club and served the dancers. We had a lot of men sign up for that event, but they weren't allowed to go. Was, wow, did they sign up. It's like, dude, not, not, not your gift. Okay, anyway. Uh, bar outreach, which we're doing this year, and different things like that. Anyway, so we did all this, and then I get this, I get this um, email. It was an email. I get this email. Um, you ready? Yeah. I have seen several of your evangelism attempts, which, by the way, they're not evangelism attempts. Just showing people that Jesus loves them right where they are is not an evangelism technique, it's truth. That no matter where you are, Jesus loves you just like you are right where you are, and he wants to love you to becoming a better person, but the love goes before the change. I've seen several of your evangelism attempts this week, and it concerns me. A strip club outreach? A bar outreach? What will happen if you continually, see this breaks my heart for this guy. What will happen if you continually keep reaching out to the goats and ignore the sheep that God has given to, your, to you for care? It will be a scary day when you wake up to the truth and realize what you are doing. At that point, of course, you will no longer have a church full of sheep, but rather a church full of goats. I pray that God will open your eyes to the error of your ways and help you to once again tend to the flock of the sheep that God has put under your care. I will be praying for you. Signed, and I'll leave his name out. Now, I'm not saying his name. So we're like, say his name. We'll email him back. <laughs> what would happen? Riddle me this, Batman. Let's say his email is true. What if we end up with nothing but a church full of goats? We would see a miraculous transformation of goats into sheep, and we would see a miraculous transformation of a city and a county. Isn't it? Let me, can I, can I see? Someone's change is not the precursor to Jesus' touch. Isn't it interesting? When you look at the New Testament, Jesus never performed a single character miracle. He, he performed many and numerous pain point miracles. You know, like, like a broken leg, um, 
deaf ears, blind eyes, mute, you know, leprosy. He, he healed all of these pain point miracles. He did all these pain point miracles, but not once. Why did he never change someone's character? Could it be, I'll let you process that out, but could it be that maybe someone's character is not the determining factor whether Jesus goes after him or not? Good or bad. We don't earn his presence. It's a thing called grace. And the only reason we're sitting here is because of a thing called grace. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad somebody found me and administered the love of Jesus Christ to my life so that I could change. I remember what I used to be like and what I used to. Did I go kill people? No, I didn't, I didn't kill nobody with my hands, but I slayed them with my tongue. I killed them with my thoughts. And just because it's one is more socially acceptable does not make it acceptable in the kingdom of God. Grace. I'm here but by grace. But by grace. Now, we have a week set out for us where we have the opportunity to invest in a better year or to ignore it and go right back to our comfortable lives that fit our schedule that we came up with because that'll make our life better. Well, our schedule has not been making our life better yet. So how about we try employing this idea of serving our community as a discipline, which is a spiritual discipline. How about we employ that in our lives this week and see if there's any change? Well, I have to work. What if you took a day off? Uh, okay. That didn't go over well. At the bottom of your message notes, did I cover all of them? I don't know. It doesn't matter. At the bottom of your message notes, there's these Servolution events. And this is what we're doing this week. Um, today, Sunday 19th, we have a car show. If you're going to volunteer for that, just show up at 2 p.m. It starts at 4 p.m., but if you're going to help set up and all that stuff, then show up at 2 p.m. Um, and it's the car show. And let me tell you the cool thing about the car show. This is being run by uh, Nikki, Ricky Neal Racing right there. Um, I'm going to have him stand up in just a second so you can look at him. But what Ricky is doing, Ricky took this idea of serving to a whole other level. He, they race. They have a funny car. Um, it's not funny. It's actually really bad. It's cool. It's, it's, I don't want to say something else. I can't say that. It's really cool. Um, but they go all over the country and race, and he felt like where they already go and what they already do is a beautiful ministry-serving opportunity. And so they, out of their own pocket, they have made these coloring books, because there's a bunch of kids made coloring books, which is the Jesus story all throughout it. The last page is an advert for South Point Church and our online campus, where they can scan the QR code and attend the online campus. They throw out and give away a bunch of South Point t-shirts and all of this stuff. We're one of the, we are now a sponsor of the Ricky Neal Racing Team. Come on, somebody. They announce us at racing tracks all across the nation. How cool is that? Ricky, will you stand real quick so they can just get a look at your beautiful face? Come on, man. And so I want him to stand so if you come to the car show and talk to him. You, you say one word to him, and I'm telling you something, his passion will overwhelm you because he sees these opportunities to just share the love of Jesus Christ. What if we all did that wherever we worked, whatever we did, whether it was work or a hobby? What if we realized that ministry is not standing on the stage speaking? It's going to work Monday through Friday and taking the love of Jesus Christ with us wherever we go. And then we have the homeless outreach. That's Tuesday the 21st. That's Tuesday. That's the 21st. Yep, meet here at the church at 8 o'clock. You, and all, let me, I'm going to read over these, and let me just say, all of them, you need to sign up. You can sign up on the QR code, you can sign up in the lobby, you can sign up on the app, but you need to sign up, okay? Um, and this, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, check this out. Our online campus, some of you, some people will complain about the online campus because you go to church here and you want the same service. Let me tell you something. I said this at the beginning, and I'm sticking to it. The online campus is not for you. The online campus is for the rest of the world that can't make it into these doors. So, people are being saved. 
people are being set free. There's a group in Arkansas that is doing Servolution just like us. They're going, they're doing a late night hospital ER outreach, which is so cool. And it's a bunch of men from a jujitsu, I think it's jujitsu, yeah, jujitsu dojo or whatever. I don't even know what they call those things. It's where they get together and get sweaty. They're going to, that sounds bad. <laughs> These dudes are going to go out and serve in the community. Okay. I will not say that second service. Okay. We're doing right here, we're doing a late night hospital ER outreach. And some people ask, well, what is that? I'll tell you what that is. We get together, we meet here at the church, and we do the night shift because the night shift at hospitals get forgotten so much. And we just go in there and we just love on them. And it's so stinking easy to do any of the events. We just love on them. We give them some energy bars, energy drinks, and candy or whatever. You know, we got a bunch of goodies. And just love on them. It's amazing to see the smile on their face. Just to say, just showing you God's love. Just showing you. Well, what do I have to say after that? Nothing. You just shared the love of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's living in you, and you step, when you step into that environment, the environment changes. That's good preaching, Pastor. Okay. Um, the May Day, Saturday the 25th, May Day, is the, the kind of the bookend of Servolution, and so it's a big event here at the church. Yes, family and kids and all that can come, but it's also our chance to serve the people that are coming, and so you can choose one or the other. Also on that day, we've got a lot going on on that day, trash pickup and beautification. Show up here at 8 o'clock. We're going to pick up some trash around the area and make this place look better. Um, Saturday, that same Saturday, we have four houses in South Haven and one in Olive Branch that we're going to do yard beautification and a little light, easy maintenance kind of stuff to fix those houses up. Those are houses of elderly or handicapped individuals that just need some extra love, extra love. Um, and then starting next Sunday, we're going to be collecting uh, stuffed animals for the police department. Not that our police officers need stuffed animals to hug in the car. But they give, if they go on to difficult calls where there's children involved, they give, you know, they keep stuffed animals in their trunks, and which is better than strapped into the seat. That would look funny. See Javier going down the road with a big old teddy bear <laughs> buckled in. I want to see that. Anyway. Um, they, they keep the stuffed animals in their truck to just show these kids love in these difficult situations, right? And then it, small group, of, there's a bunch of small group events, um, and those are the small groups that are doing those, and you just need to be a part of a small group because we do this all the time. This is not just a once-a-year thing. We do this all the time. Our lives should be a life of service. We do it as a big group this time of year so that we can just share that love and give everybody the opportunity to do that, okay? Everybody good? Everybody good? I know I'm supposed to end with a big altar call and all that. Here's your altar call moment. This week, sign up for a Servolution event and show up and take what you already have in you to somebody else who needs it. It's time we leave the 99 and go find the one. Come on, that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. All right, stand with me if you will. There's numerous ways to sign up, and there's lots of graduates out there that you can give them a high five and tell them how proud you are of them. Are you ready to pray the benediction, and we will jet on out of here? Hopefully I'll see two people. Great. Um, hopefully I'll see you today at 4 o'clock or 2 o'clock for the car show. It'll be awesome. All right. Now may God, the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his super abundance until we radiate with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go radiate hope.